I'd like to take a minute to really appreciate who this man is and all that he has done, not only for me personally, but for all of us. I know that I, without the light and the optimism that Caleb and the Center for Political Innovation offers and that perspective, I really don't know where I would be. Uh, I, I, I might be lost, I might get, be confused. That's the, the general picture. Um, but I think sometimes when you're involved in anti-imperialism and you're involved with the kind of work that we, that we do uh, as anti-imperialists, for as long as someone like Caleb has, you, you tend to rack up a bit of a resume. So uh, let's, let's take a second and let's just go over a few of the things that he's accomplished in his years as an activist. In 2010, two black activists were acquitted because Caleb went to their court case and he showed footage that he had of police brutalizing them and showed that uh, basically you know, they were being charged with assaulting a police officer. He showed that they didn't do it. That was in Cleveland. During Occupy Wall Street, he was the official media spokesperson for the great anti-imperialist former Attorney General Ramsey Clark. In 2015, he participated in a humanitarian mission to Yemen with the Red Crescent Society, creating an international incident. Yeah. It was covered in The Guardian. Mainstream media even picked up on it. That's pretty big. And the very next year, our favorite president, Donald Trump, named Caleb his favorite reporter. <laughs> so without further ado, let's welcome the ideological leader of the Center for Political Innovation, someone I'm proud to call a mentor and a friend, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Caleb Moffin. Yeah. Stay standing, stay standing, and stretch a little bit, because we're getting near the end of our program. So uh, at what point do we want to submit super chats, or is that more... <laughs> <laughs> Could be a long night, could be a long night. <laughs> Names and locations. Names and locations, everybody. Names and locations. <laughs> Oh boy. All right. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. All right. But, uh, wow. What an amazing conference. This is our first national convention of the Center for Political Innovation, and I'm overjoyed. Now, I would like Elizabeth to stand up. Yes. Because there's, there's a very important issue. There's a very important issue that we've been discussing with the Board of Directors, and that is that we have determined after intense debate and negotiation that one does not have to have red hair in order to be in the leadership of the Center for Political Innovation. We will allow non-gingers into leadership. It is allowed. Um, you know, it'll, you're going to be careful, though, but it'll be allowed. But in all seriousness, you guys have no idea how much work Elizabeth has done. You really have no idea. I just found out today that she personally made every single one of those banners. Each one of those represents 10 hours of work from Elizabeth. 10 hours. And we have had an amazing event. Elizabeth found this venue. She, she organized this. She did so much. So we are in deep, deep appreciation to all that she has done. Not just for this convention, but for this organization. We are proud to call her our president. This is the leader of the Center for Political Innovation right here, Elizabeth Young. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, everyone who's wearing a red scarf, could you please stand up? Yeah? These are the members of the CPI who helped put on and convene the conference. And we decided to get red scarves. And we also have buttons. Uh, buttons. Does someone have, have one of the buttons? 
uh, the, the button here, it says Anna Louise Strong Brigade. That's what we decided to call the members of the CPI that came to town to convene the conference. That's Anna Louise Strong. And this is an American that so many people don't know anything about. She's a name that's kind of been written out of the history books. But she's been pivotal, not just in the history of this country, but in the history of the world. Anna Louise Strong was from this part of the country and was a key leader of the Seattle General Strike in 1919. Uh, she was the main journalist for the Union Record, which was the wobbly labor paper in Seattle. Uh, and then, after the strike was defeated, uh, she heard about this new country that was created called the Soviet Union, and she went over there and saw what they were achieving, the amazing things that they were achieving. Uh, she came back to the United States and wrote books about it and went on speaking tours about it. And eventually, uh, she moved to Moscow, and she was the editor of the Moscow News, uh, which was the English language newspaper that they had in Moscow in the 1930s. So, I like to say she was... RT before uh, before RT. She's old school RT right here. This is old school RT. And uh, Anna Louise Strong, eventually she moved to China and she interviewed Mao Zedong. And it was in her interview with Mao that the, Mao first used the phrase paper tigers to describe the imperialists. She was not loved in this country due to McCarthyism, so she spent her final years in China. And uh, in China, she was known as the paper tiger lady, and Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai and other key leaders of the Chinese Communist Party would come over to her house all the time to consult with her on politics, really comprehended economics and political theory. She was also deeply poetic. Her writing is deeply beautiful, and it was discovering her writing as a teenager. Uh, I discovered her autobiography, I Change Worlds, uh, her, her memoir of living uh, in the Soviet Union called The Stalin Era, uh, her, her writing The Soviets Expected It about World War II. Uh, she wrote so much about the socialist movement and what it's about. And in everything she wrote, she brought with it a spirit of Americanism. She was not ashamed to be an American. She knew this country did a lot of evil things, but there was Americanism that just flowed through everything everything that she wrote. I'm going to read to you something that that amazing woman who's been left out of U.S. history wrote. And this was at the time that that great Seattle general strike was happening. This is what she wrote. This is an editorial she wrote for the Seattle Union Record. She said, we are undertaking the most tremendous move ever made by labor in this country. A move that will lead no one knows where we do not need hysteria. We need the iron march of labor. Labor will feed the people. Twelve great kitchens have been offered, and from them food will be distributed and provision trades at low cost to all. Labor will care for the babies and the sick. The milk wagon drivers and laundry drivers are arranging plans for supplying milk to babies, invalids, and hospitals, and taking care of linen for the hospitals. Labor will preserve order. The strike committee is arranging for guards and is expected that the stopping of the cars will keep people at home. Let them get this straight. It is not the withdrawal of labor power, but the power of workers to manage that will win this strike. The closing down of Seattle's industries, a mere shutdown, will not affect these Eastern gentlemen very much. They could let the whole Northwest go to pieces as far as money alone is concerned. But the closing down of capitalist controlled industries in Seattle, while the workers organize to feed the people, to care for the babies and the sick, and to preserve order, this will move them. For this looks too much like the taking of power by the workers. Labor will not only shut down the industries, labor will reopen. And that is why they say that we are starting out on a road that leads no one knows where. That's Anna Louise Strong in 1919, talking about how the potential of the strike wasn't going to be from creating disorder, wasn't going to be from creating chaos. It would be about the new, beautiful order that emerged when working people stepped up and started taking responsibility and taking participation in the leadership of their society. That the strike would preserve and present a new order that's what she was writing about. She was a city builder. Mm -hmm. Anna Louise Strong. And we live in an age where there's so much pessimism. And a lot has been said about this. I won't be the pers person to make this comparison. But 
The time period we're living in is a lot like the lead up to the First World War. Because war brings out the worst in people. And it makes people hopeless about humanity. It makes people question what it's all worth. And there's a poem that they used to make boomers memorize in school. They don't do that anymore. That's the thing they used to do is they used to make kids memorize poems in school. And there's one poem they used to make kids memorize. And because it was so widely taught in school, uh, people make fun of it a lot. So you've probably heard people reference it. And it goes like this. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lift, lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. Upon whose bosoms snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. <laughs> you ever hear that poem before? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was written by Joyce Kilmer. And Joyce Kilmer was shot in the head during World War I. And that poem expressed the pessimism of the age. It expressed the belief that all this technological advancement, all this progress, wasn't really leading to a beautiful new world. Instead, it was just giving us new weapons with which to kill each other, new technology with which to gun each other down. It was looking, looking to nature, looking with defeat at humanity. Only God can make a tree. Looking at human progress, looking at the idea that we can advance as a species with pessimism and cynicism and hopelessness. It's a cry of defeat. And, as I said, war brings out the worst in people. You know, my grandfather, he fought in the Second World War, and he went into the U.S. Marine Corps. He was from a small town in Missouri, and he and all the other young men from his small town in rural Missouri, they went into the U.S. Marine Corps. And my grandfather hated the U.S. Marine Corps. And he would see a billboard for the Marines, or he would hear the Marine anthem, and he would get angry, he would vis visibly angry. He hated the basic training that they went through. It was very brutal. And uh, he went through basic training, and they gave him a, an IQ intelligence you know, test, uh, and he tested pretty high, and so they switched him into the U.S. Navy. And he was an officer in the U.S. Navy. So then after the war, he went to meet up with all the young men who had fought with him in the U.S. Marines. But he couldn't meet with them because they were all dead. All of them had died except for one. And he met with the one surviving member of his unit in the U.S. Marines. And the guy was visibly not well. And in the conversation they had when they had dinner, he bragged to my grandfather about all the gold that he had pulled out of the teeth of Japanese corpses during the war. And my grandfather heard that, and he was just hurt by that. But my grandfather was in the US Navy. He was a, a, a Navy officer during the war. And he also told us the story of how one day he was getting his hair cut. Uh, and he was getting his hair cut, and a torpedo hit the front of his ship, you know, blew the front of the ship off. And then, as he was right there getting his hair cut, he gasped as a torpedo came through the wall and didn't explode. Right there as he was getting his hair cut, and it didn't go off. And in that moment, he thought he was going to die, and a couple men had died when the torpedo hit the front of the ship, and he survived. And my grandfather, the, the Birch, the visceral hatred he had for the U.S. Marine Corps, that was a result of seeing the very same things that, that motivated Joyce Kilmer, the very same things that Rosa Luxemburg wrote about and was describing when she wrote about socialism or barbarism. She said that imperialism left unhinged up to its natural capacity would lead to desolation, degeneration, depopulation, and a great cemetery in Europe. It would lead to civilizations coming apart. She was describing what Frederick Nietzsche talks about when he talks about the blonde beast and how by becoming a colonizer and an imperialist, the Western man was losing any pretense of being civilized, any moral code. It was becoming the law of the jungle once again. Might makes right. Cruelty, the, the, the thriving of the most sadistic and vicious elements. That's what imperialism was leading to. And in imperialist wars, we see that ugliness come out. And that's what drives a lot of the pessimism that we saw in the lead up to the First World War. But Marxism is the opposite of that. Marxism is a celebration of human creativity. Frederick Engels, 
He said, the animal merely uses its environment and brings about changes in it simply by its presence. But man, by his changes, makes it serve his ends, masters it. And this is the final distinction between man and other animals. And it is labor that brings about this distinction. What's he saying there? He's saying that ants have been making their ant farms the same way for thousands of years. Beavers have been making their beaver dams the same way for thousands of years. But in just five, six, seven, eight thousand years, human beings have gone from hunter-gatherers in the woods to space travel and iPhones, and we are constantly reinventing our relationship with our environment. We are constantly expanding our population, expanding our living standard, providing a more comfortable life, and that this is what makes human beings unique, is that we are constantly reinventing our relationship with nature to build a better life. And no other species that we're aware of anywhere in the universe is capable of doing what human beings are doing, are capable of doing. This is a, a godlike creative power that other species do not have. And that's something to celebrate. And that's something to be optimistic about. And Marxism teaches us that hunter-gatherer civilization was around for a long time. But we got too good at hunter-gatherer civilization. With our sticks and rocks, we were killing animals pretty effectively. With our ability to track, you know, plants grow, our ability to gather fruits and nuts, we got good at it, so there was a scarcity. So we reinvented our relationship with nature, and we started growing our own crops and domesticating animals. We reinvented our relationship to get to a higher mode. And feudalism was an outmoded system, and so Again, we had another social revolution to get us to a higher mode of existence so we could create and build better things. And Marxism has us understanding what the problem that we're in right now is, because we need to be very clear about what is driving the crisis. This is one thing that it's, it's basic Marxism. If you read old pamphlets from the 1930s, if you ask Anna Louise Strong or William Z. Foster or Huey Long or even Fred Hampton, they would tell you this in a heartbeat. They knew this stuff. They knew it like the back of their hand. But no one talks this way anymore, except for the Center for Political Innovation. We're the only ones that talk about this. The communist parties around the world that make up the world anti-imperialist platform, they say in their documents that the crisis facing society is a crisis of overproduction. That's what it is, and it's pretty basic, which is that the capitalist is constantly trying to produce as many goods as he possibly can and pay the worker as little as he possibly can in the process of doing it. And then the worker doesn't have enough to buy back what he produces. And in a rational society, self-driving cars would be a great thing because this job called driving wouldn't be necessary and human labor would be much more productive. But in capitalism, self-driving cars would lead to, as Andrew Yang put it, riots in the streets. It would be a society-wide crisis. And the fact that we're just a couple years away from self-driving cars is hanging over our economy as a curse. This isn't rational. And systems of the past, you've all heard me say it before, people were homeless because there wasn't enough housing. Only under capitalism are people homeless because there is too much housing. Systems of the past, people were hungry because there wasn't enough food. But only under capitalism are people hungry because there is too much food. The little boy says to his father, why is it so cold? He says, because I lost my job at the coal mine. He says, why did you lose your job at the coal mine? He says, I got laid off. And he says, why did you get laid off from your job at the coal mine? He says, because there's too much coal. That's capitalism. That's the problem with capitalism. And the artificial intelligence computer revolution, the great dynamic breakthroughs in human intelligence that we've created, they have outstripped the narrow limits and restraints of the capitalist system. Human creativity and human ability to reinvent our relationship with Mother Nature, to, to strive for a higher and more efficient mode of production, is no longer able to fit into the narrow restraints of an economy where profit for private owners defines production. And that is what is driving the crisis that is leading to dropping living standards around here. That is what is causing the crisis of global migration. That is what is causing the capitalists of the United States to become more aggressive and push for a new world war around the world. That is what is causing the capitalists of the United States to fight with each other like they've never fought before in generations. 
It's all rooted in this problem of overproduction and the tendency of the falling rate of profit. And the answer isn't degrowth. The answer isn't to go backward. The answer isn't to say there's something inherently wrong with human progress. The answer is to say that we need to liberate the creativity of the next generation from the artificial restrictions and the narrow restraints of the profit system. One thing that we see a lot of now is frustrated, creative youth. Young people, young men, young women, who know that they're capable of doing something great. There's probably a young person right now sweeping the floor at McDonald's or, or doing some other job where they're miserable, and they're saying to themselves, I'm miserable because I know I could be doing something beautiful right now. I could be designing something. I could be studying engineering. I could be studying science. I, I have something to contribute. But all my society has given me is a low-wage, short-term service sector job. It's given me a phone to dazzle me. It's legalized all kinds of drugs that I can use and screw myself up with. And, and my potential is not being utilized. Exactly. And that is a frustration that so many young people have in this country right now. Right. They say young people are lazy, they don't want to do anything. Bullshit. Exactly. When people are 19 years old, 20 years old, 22, 23, that's when they want to go out and do things. Yep. Mm -hmm. But because some boss can't make a profit hiring them to do it, they don't get to do it. Exactly. And they s exist in this state of frustration, knowing I'm capable of something more. I have potential inside of me and my society isn't letting me get it out. And that feeling is all over this country. And if you want to talk about all the problems that we've got with opioids and suicide and shooters and all of that, you look at that frustrated creativity. Exactly. When people want to go build and create and build into the future and they're told, no, no, just, just, just go the other way, it's the worst feeling in the world. I'm a little older now. I'm not officially a youth anymore. Did you know that? I'm going to be 36 in a few days, and I'm not officially a youth anymore, but what, I know what it's like to be a frustrated, creative young person. And that's how I found out about this guy. So I was a frustrated, creative teenager in Ohio. I was 13, 14 years old, and I was bored. And so I got on the internet, and I thought that I would look and see if in the little town in Ohio that I grew up in, it's called Orville, it's where Smucker's Jelly comes from, you can look it up, right? Home of Bobby Knight, uh, the basketball coach, that's the celebrity that, that we claim. Uh, I'm from Orville, Ohio, and I just thought I would Google on the internet to see if there had ever been another communist from Orville, Ohio. And I thought, you know, has, it ever, has there ever been anyone in the history of my little town of 10,000 people who was a communist? And I Googled and I found out about Carl Geiser. And that's this man, Carl Geiser. And Carl Geiser was born in Orville, Ohio. And he went to Orville High School and he was a pretty high achieving student. So he went to Cleveland State University and he studied electrical engineering. And he graduated and he became an electrical engineer. But the United States was having, at that point, a Great Depression. And there weren't many jobs for electrical engineers. But there was another country where there were a lot of jobs for electrical engineers. And that was the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And he went over to the Soviet Union to help Stalin set up those new hydroelectrical power plants that they were building and help electrify parts of the country that had never had it before. And he was over there in the Soviet Union building and constructing, and he was blown away by what he saw. And he came back to the United States from the Soviet Union, and he joined the Communist Party of the United States of America. Carl Geiser joined the Communist Party. It's a guy from my town because he saw what socialism was achieving. A lot of people joined the Communist Party back in that time, right? I mean, it wasn't a, a, something, he was the only one to have done that. But what made Carl Geiser unique, the reason he's got a Wikipedia page and he's, you know, remembered, is uh, Carl Geiser signed up to join the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Woo! Fascists were looking to overthrow the Spanish Republic. The communists of Spain called for their comrades around the world to come and volunteer to fight fascism in Spain. And so thousands of young American men went to Spain and fought. And Carl Geiser was actually taken prisoner 
and he was a prisoner of war in fascist Spain. And he almost died. If they had found out what his rank actually was, they would have shot him. But his, his comrades concealed his rank and did not reveal how high up he was, so they didn't execute him. And eventually Roosevelt got him traded back to the United States in a prisoner exchange. And he came back to the United States, and he's a hero of the Spanish Civil War, a leader of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. And when you think about the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, that points to an aspect of our movement that it's really important to understand. There's a famous writer named Sherwood Anderson. You ever heard of Sherwood Anderson? He wrote Winesburg, Ohio. He was a, a novelist. And at one point, Sherwood Anderson was asked, what's the difference between a socialist and a communist? What's the difference? And he said, I don't know the technical difference, but it seems to me like the communists, they're the ones who mean it. <laughs> and what he was pointing to was the fact that when we do something, we really do it. <laughs> In the early 1930s, the understanding was that the Social Democrats and the reformists, the sellout leaders who had sold out the revolution in Germany, that were leading workers to oppose the Soviet Union in the name of socialism, that they were the main threat. And it was necessary to expose the Social Democrats and the reformists. And so when that was the line of the Communist International, we didn't just half-ass oppose the Social Democrats. We didn't just sort of oppose the Social Democrats. We went all in. We really opposed the Social Democrats because we understood that that was what was necessary. And so all over the world, communists went into class against class mode to expose the social democrats and build a united front from below because we understood that that was the correct tactic. And then we know that after the rise of Hitler and as the situation changed, the line changed and it became correct to align with the social democrats in a united front against fascism. And when that line changed, we didn't just half-ass align with them against fascism. What did we do? We built the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and went and fought in Spain. We had the Battle of Cable Street in London. We built huge anti-fascist mobilizations. We are the reason Roosevelt won the 1936 presidential election. Yep. When we do something, we do it hard. We do it hard. There was a labor leader who once remarked, he said, if it's three in the morning, at your labor union hall and there's two guys running the mimeograph machine, you can bet at least one of them is a communist. <laughs> and the people who criticize our movement, right, this is a really common critique from Trotskyites, is they'll say, well, hey, they zigzag, you know, they're always reversing themselves, you know, they do this and then they do that, yeah. If the situation changes in 24 hours, the tactics must also change in 24 hours. And sometimes what's correct on Monday is not correct on Tuesday, and it's not correct on Wednesday, and you have to change your tactics. And when you're as dedicated as we are, and when you never half-ass these things, when you take it very seriously, when you are fully committed to achieving what we aim to achieve, it can look a little strange to people who don't get it. And they can go, well, one day you're running this way, and the next day you're running this way. Yes, and every way that we run, we're running hard because we understand that it's necessary and that it must be done. And that brings me to a story or a bit of wisdom that was passed down to me. You know, we can, we can be critical of different figures, but Sam Marcy, an important leader of communism in the post-war years, he would often talk about how at the anti-war protests that happened during the 1960s, where you'd have hundreds of thousands of people marching against the Vietnam War, They'd be these beautiful puppets that they would build. Mm -hmm. They'd have puppets of you know, Richard Nixon with his money or whatever. They'd have puppets of the heroic Vietnamese people fighting for their liberation, these beautiful puppets. Mm -hmm. That there were whole communities of people, and they weren't members of any communist group, but they were against the Vietnam War and had a general leftist, anti-imperialist view. And they made it their mission that when there was a big anti-war rally, they would come together and they would make these beautiful works of art as their contribution to opposing the war in Vietnam. And there were whole communities that built these puppets. It was their project, their way of being creative, of building community and coming together. And there were couples who met each other through the process of making those puppets. And a couple of years later, they were there making the puppets with their little kids that they had just had. And there were whole communities of people. And they made it their mission. This is something that we can do. 
Imperialism is the enemy of humanity. The Vietnam War is horrible. And this is something we can do. We have a nine to five job, we have a regular life, but this is something that we can do. And we can do it together, and we can bond, and that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. What Sam Morrissey would tell his followers is that that community that built those puppets, that's a thousand times more valuable than some, some, some kid who thinks he's Lenin. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. A community like that has longevity. People are doing that their whole life, and they're taking on a contribution. And that, that, you know, if you've been doing this as long as I have, which is, you know, not that long, relatively speaking, but you realize there are some people who come around and they see that they don't get the immediate result that they want. They see that they, they don't, uh, you know, they, they don't fulfill their dictator fantasy that they have. Uh, you know, they, they see that they, uh, you know, they see that, 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 that this isn't exactly the way they want to resolve their parental issues or, or whatever. And then they go away after a year. They go away after a year. For a year, they know more than everybody. No one knows anything better. They can debate everybody, but they're gone. For those people who came together to build the puppets and build community around it and learn to work together, they keep going. Mm -hmm. And generation after generation, year after year, they build those puppets. Mm -hmm. And that is what we need to build with the Center for Political Innovation. We need a network of people who are committed to opposing imperialism who learn to trust each other and rely on each other and carry out operations, build some beautiful puppets, some beautiful artwork, put on beautiful conferences, and keep this movement alive. Yeah. That is what we need to build. We need a network of people who love each other and trust each other and can work together and can serve the purpose of representing the anti-imperialist movement in America. That is what we need, and that is what I want us to build at the Center for Political Innovation. I remember the first time I went to a big anti-war rally, and it was, in, it was in New York City, and I'd never been to New York City. I was 18 years old. Me and my high school buddy, we went up to Cleveland, and we got on a bus from the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, and we went to New York City. It was in April of 2006, and it was one of the last anti-war marches before Obama took office, right, in the last years of the Bush administration. And we walked around, and it was a huge anti-war gathering. The Democrats were mobilizing people to march against the war in those days, and this huge anti-war rally. Me and my friend were just in awe. I'd never been to New York City, and I'm looking up at the, the skyscrapers, and I'm seeing this communist group over here, and this communist group over here. And as we got towards the end of the march, I'll never forget, I will never, never forget, there was a group of old men in wheelchairs on the side of the march. Not a big group. Probably only five or six of them, if that. They had a big banner. You know what it said? Veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade against the war in Iraq. I was so happy to see that sketch that you all did about the story of Mr. Grosset. You know, that was a beautiful innovation. I think Noah and Killian thought of it on their own, right? You, you, you heard it on the stream, and the two of you, who, whose idea was it? It doesn't matter. It doesn't, really it doesn't really matter. It was amazing. It was beautiful, right? And it was a beautiful little sketch to show how this guy, who had backward reactionary ideas, was, you know, mugged by reality, by the reality of capitalism, and became a socialist and a revolutionary. It was a beautiful story, and we need to recreate that sketch at different conferences and different events. We need to do it for different audiences. And we need to come up with different, different sketches like it, articulating that message. Now, in my History of the Communist Party, I quote from Angelo Herndon's autobiography. He wrote a book called You Cannot Kill the Working Class. And in that book, he talks about, as being a black organizer in the US South, about how the Communist Party dealt with the racism that was deeply entrenched in the communities. He wrote, I remember one white worker, a carpenter, who was one of the first people I talked to in Atlanta. He was very friendly to me. He came to me one day and said that he agreed with our program, but something was holding him back from joining the Unemployment Council. I said, what's that, Jim? I asked him. Really, though, I didn't have to ask because I knew the South, and I could guess. 
He said, well, I just don't figure that white folks and black folks should mix together. It won't never do to organize them in one body. And I said, look here, Jim, you know that the carpenters and all the other workers get a darn sight less pay for the same work in the South than they do in other parts. Did you ever figure out why he had? Well, I said, I'll tell you why. It's because the bosses have got us split up and down here. We Southern workers are, good, are as good fighters as anywhere, but we haven't been able to get equal wages with the workers in other places. We haven't gotten any rights to speak of, and that's because we're divided. When the whites go on strike, the bosses call the black people in to scab. And when the black people strike, the bosses call in the white people to scab. Did you ever figure out why the unions here are so weak? It's because whites don't want to organize with black people, and black people don't trust the whites. And we haven't got the simplest human rights down here. We're not allowed to organize. We're not allowed to hold meetings except in secret. And we can't vote, most of us, because the bosses are so anxious to keep the black people from voting, they make laws that take away the right of white workers to vote as well. And we Southern workers are like a house that's divided against itself. We're like an army that goes out to fight the enemy and stops <coughs> on the way because the men are too busy fighting each other. Take this relief business now, I said. The commissioners tell the whites they can't give them any more relief because they have to feed so many black people. And the black people ought to be chased back to the farms. And then they turn around and tell the black people that the white people have to come first for the relief. So there's nothing they can do for the black people. And that way they put us off getting us scrapping with each other. But now suppose the white unemployed and the black unemployed all go down to the commissioner's office together. And they say, we are starving, we are all in need, and we've decided to get together into one strong, powerful organization to make you come across with the relief. Don't you see how foolish it is to go into the fight with half an army when we could have a whole one? Don't you think that an empty belly is a pretty punk exchange for the honor of being called a superior race? Can't you realize that as long as one foot is chained to the ground, the other can't travel very far? And Jim didn't say anything to me that day. I guess he went home and he thought it over. He came back a week later and he invited me to his house. It was the first time he'd ever had a black person in his house as a friend and an equal. When I got there, I found two other black workers that Jim had brought in to the unemployment council. And about a month later, Jim beat up a rent collector who was boarding up the house of an evicted worker. And then he went on to organize a committee of black and white together to see the mayor about the case. Today it's the black worker across town, and tomorrow it'll be me, Jim said to the mayor. And there are a lot of Jims today all over the South. That, that's Angelo Herndon. And that's why these people who talk about class reductionism, class reductionism, don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Because the picket line and class solidarity has been the most effective battering ram against racial division. And, and they've rewritten the history of the anti-racist struggle to ignore all of that beautiful history. And we have the tough job of putting forward the line that built the tenant unions of the South, the sharecroppers unions, the text that built the labor movement, right? This kind of class solidarity, putting the needs of the oppressed first so that the whole class can advance, that was the line that created industrial unions in this country. Communists around the world have deep roots in communities. They don't here in the United States. I always tell people, if you want to study the history of American communism, there's two groups you can study. One, the Communist Party before World War II, before McCarthyism, right? In the 1930s, when they were big, when they were with Roosevelt. Two, the Black Panthers, right? They, in the 1970s, they had deep roots in the community. Everybody else, eh, you know, they haven't really accomplished much, right? You know, maybe you can go back to Eugene Debs or, or folks that, that came before the Russian Revolution. But, but post-1917, there's really only two groups in American history that had significant impact on society. One group might have done something here or something there, but, but really those are the only two groups that ever had deep roots among the community. 
But when I go to global communist youth gatherings, I see parties that have millions of members, that have deep roots in communities. I've told this story before, and I'm going to tell it again, because there might be somebody here tonight who hasn't heard it, so I'm going to tell it again. The first time I ever went to a global World Youth Festival, the Global Communist Youth Festival, was in 2013. I went to Quito, Ecuador. And our plane landed in Ecuador, and I was with five communists from the United States, and we're there, and they moved us to a special section of the airport where the different communist groups from around the world that were there for the festival were gathering. They had buses that were picking us up, taking us to the festival. And we're all there sitting in the airport. We're trading newspapers. You know, the, the communists from Vietnam are over here. The communists from Angola are over here. The communists from Sri Lanka are over here. The Venezuelans and the Vietnamese are over here. We're talking with each other. And then the airport starts to get quiet. It gets quiet for a minute. People start whispering that the plane from North Korea has just arrived. And then the whole airport goes silent. And a door flies open, bam. And they march in in perfect unison. And the men are wearing suits and ties. And the women are wearing traditional Korean gowns. And they march in in perfect unison. And that whole airport is dead silent. And one person starts clapping. And then another person starts clapping. And pretty soon, I was standing in an airport with thousands of communists who were on their feet cheering for the Kim Il-sung youth of North Korea. And in that moment, tears poured down my face, and I thought about all the Korean people who have died at the hands of our government. And then I thought about how I am an anti-imperialist in every ounce of my being, and this is where I belong. That was a great moment in my life I will never forget. I am so happy that we have been selected to attend the World Youth Festival in Russia in 2024. And I'm really happy to have Chris Halali on the National Preparatory Committee working on it with us. And honestly, folks, I expect it won't be as easy as it looks, right? I totally expect the American government to try and outlaw the World Youth Festival, to try to say it's illegal. And we are prepared to have a press conference at the United Nations with lawyers and attorneys and others there to say we have the right to attend this festival. We have the right to go meet the youth, not just from Russia, but from Vietnam and China and Cuba and People's Korea and Africa. We have the right to go to that festival just like any other country that we would want to visit as Americans. festivals have meant in my life. I really, I deeply know what they have meant in my life, and I want other people to see it for themselves. I want people to see what real communists look like. Communists who have millions and millions of people in their organizations. Communists who have seats in parliament. Communists who have deep roots in their community. Communists who are standing with Russia and China and Iran and Venezuela against the imperialists. I want people to meet that movement. That is my movement, that is our movement as CPI, and that is the movement that I want everyone in this room to meet and embrace and become the American expression of. Yes. And get ready for this one. So at that World Youth Festival that I was at in 2013, I was talking with communists from Japan, right? And I did not know a lot about communism in Japan. But the Japanese Communist Party is a pretty large communist party. Now it's become Euro-communist and reformist in recent years. But I, I learned a lot from these communists from Japan. One thing I learned from them is that you know, in Japan, the communists don't talk a lot about Hiroshima and Nagasaki because the people who do talk about it tend to be apologists for Japanese fascism. So you know, they try not to talk about it as much. Another thing I learned from them is that during the Second World War, the majority of the members of the Japanese Communist Party were Korean slaves. Did you know this? They were Koreans that had been taken from the Korean Peninsula as slaves and forced to work in Japan. And do you know what the Japanese Communist Party that was majority Korean at that time, do you know what they did? They were making weapons, making bombs and torpedoes and all of that. Do you know what they did? 
they went out of their way to sabotage, to make sure that some of those shells didn't explode, to make sure that some of those bombs didn't go off, to make sure that some of those torpedoes didn't, didn't go off. When I heard that story, I had to think of my grandfather. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Think about it. Think about it. Yeah. I might not be standing here if it wasn't for some amazing Korean communists. Yeah. And it's realizations like that and weird coincidences like that with Carl Geiser over the years that have gotten me to realize that there's a reason I'm doing this. I'm here for a reason. I'm doing this. I think God put me on this earth for a reason. I'm here serving a purpose. And you know, I have, I, I mean, we can tell the stories, but do you know why all those people are so great and so remembered? It's because of what they did what they accomplished in the real world. Fred Hampton built a free breakfast program. He organized the people of Chicago into a rainbow coalition. And for that, he was such a threat to the American status quo that he was murdered. Huey Long, the leader in Louisiana, who Huey Newton, the founder of the Black Panthers, is named after, said, every man a king. He built roads and highways all over the state. He was so loved for the programs that he provided. He built a share our wealth movement all over the country, and he was shot down. William Z. Foster, the leader of the American Communist Party, who organized an organization with unemployment councils and trade unions and amazing dynamic leader, writer. You know, I always encourage people to study his works, but he was a brilliant trade unionist and organizer. Anna Louise Strong, I just read you her beautiful work. They're all great because of what they did. They're not great because somebody came along and gave them a title. They're not great because somebody came along and put a crown upon their head and said, you are the one. That's not how it works. And folks, one of the saddest things I've seen in our movement is that there are people that have been doing this for a long time that know that it's time for somebody to step up to the plate. Right? When AOC got in to office, remember that? I remember when AOC got in there and, you know, I met so many older folks who went on delegations to Cuba and went on delegations to Nicaragua and they tried so hard to like AOC. They wanted to like AOC. You know, she's young, she's good looking, and she says she's a socialist, but maybe she can be good. Maybe she can be good. Well, she wasn't good, was she? But they tried, they wanted there to be somebody that they could believe in. And look, I, I have to say this, and it's not what people like to hear, and I've heard a million excuses from people about why, why it's not the case, but you just have to acknowledge it. People who've been waiting for years for a real socialist movement that is really trying new ideas and really expanding and really building deep roots among the community and really aiming high and not just in the same old you know, hamster wheel of doing the same old thing, those folks shouldn't be waiting any longer because that organization is right here in this room. For. This organization is what you've been looking for, and you can make so many excuses about why we're not it. I'm sure that we're all not the right kind of LGBTQ, XYZ, we're, you know, we're the wrong nationality, we're from the wrong part, we have the wrong words, whatever. But you cannot deny that we are here, and we are doing it, and we're getting better at it, and they have thrown everything they can at us to make us stop. And if we were going to stop, we would have stopped by now. Yeah. Yeah. And if we were a fraud, if we were one of their plants, they'd be making it a hell of a lot easier for us, wouldn't they? <laughs> they have thrown everything they can at us, but we keep coming back, and we have proved that we won't back down. We won't go away. We won't fade away. We are what people have been waiting for. Yeah. And it's time that folks came forward and just recognized that we are the organization that they've been waiting for, and maybe we don't sound the way they thought we would sound, we don't look the way we thought they would look, but here we are. Yeah. We are here. Yeah. yeah! I want to 
want to say this. The reason that we're the ones cut out for this task is because we love our country. And there are some people, when we talk about patriotic socialism, they get kind of a clever look in their eye. And they're like, oh, people think socialism's anti-American, so you're going to be the patriotic socialist. I get it. No, we actually love this country. We don't love the government. We don't love the big banks and corporations, but we actually love this country. We love the people of this country. We love the optimistic glow of hope that flows through this society. We love the fact that people have come here from all over the world in all kinds of different circumstances. Some people dragged here in chains, some people jumping over fences, some people, some people the generations past. There's people from all over the world, different corners of this planet that have all been dragged to one spot by the imperialist system. We've come here. We've come here because we have a will to survive. I talk about why are there so many amazing black musicians and black athletes? Well, think about what the black community has been subjected to. Genocidal conditions, the transatlantic slave trade, millions of people slaughtered. You think about you know, the, the death camp they had in Angola, Louisiana, where they were working people to death. And the reason that the black community in America, the reason people, you know, Michael Jordan is known about all over the planet, the reason that jazz and R&B is listened to all across this planet, that's because there's a beauty in the American black community because it represents those who had this amazing, unbeatable will to survive. Right, yeah. They survived all of that horror. Yeah. This is a strong people. And you think about other nationalities that have come here. People have come to this country because they want to build, they want to grow, they believe that their kids could have a better life, and they go through all kinds of hardship in order to get onto these shores from different corners of the planet, all because they want to grow, they want to build, they want to construct. And now we're all gathered here, white, black, Arab, Asian, Latino, we're all here gathered in this one little tract of land between the Atlantic and the Pacific. And now the imperialists are telling us, well, we gotta accept being poor. In order to save our system, you've all just gotta be poorer. So, you know, that American dream thing, turn that off, turn that off, and just accept being poorer. It's for the environment, it's for COVID, whatever. Just accept being poorer, look at your phone and be dazzled. And they think this is gonna work. Well, it's only a matter of time before they realize that they have been the stupidest, stupidest imperialists in history. What they've done is they've gathered millions of people from all over the planet and they've dragged them all into one place so that we can all come together and kick their ass! USA are having a convention and we're going to do our best to participate but in addition to that so we all know about this this is the manual the educational manual of the CPI and we have a series of classes now called the Saxton lectures that are basic a basic introduction to anti-imperialism and socialism right and we've done them throughout the country and we're doing them here in Portland uh, next weekend by the way December 8th 9th and 10th Friday Saturday and Sunday a week from today we're going to be doing those classes here so if you're local or if you're around or you want to drive back or whatever we're doing it and it's available to anybody free you can come and we're going to do we're going to do these classes but this is just the introduction and this was the basis this this book is the companion volume that goes with the Saxon lectures and that's the introduction to what we're all about Marx Lenin the synthetic left etc um, however it's been realized that the wisdom of this organization and the intellectual project that, that we've created together has produced a lot more wisdom. This was just basic. We're past this now. So what we need is another volume. We need volume two, and we need a second level of classes. So after the World Youth Festival, we're going to be gathering at a new property in Vermont uh, that we, we have access to. And uh, we are going to have class level number two. 
the second installment, level two, and we're going to have volume two uh, of our educational manual. And there was a, there's another level that's been added. I want to clarify another point, which is that, you know, Conrad Jyoti, you know, she emphasized uh, the issue of peaceful transition to socialism. And I know why she did that. Because she very much sees and has been a critic of what, of what Khrushchevite revisionism and the Sino-Soviet split has done. And part of that was Khrushchev insisting on a peaceful transition to socialism and telling people in Africa and Asia and Latin America that they couldn't pick up a gun for their national liberation. Right? That when Khrushchev came in after the death of Stalin, he said, well, America has the atomic bomb, so all you people around the world that are fighting for your freedom can't do it. It's too dangerous. And he tried to call off the world revolution in the name of, of the USA having the atomic bomb. And Mao said, no, no, we're not going to accept that. Right? And, and Mao was very critical of Khrushchev and his statement about a peaceful transition to socialism. And, you know, it's not that we disagree. We don't disagree with Jyoti at all. It's a matter of emphasis. Because it's one thing to say that, to say that a peaceful transition to socialism is unlikely. Because the capitalists don't really believe in their democratic ideals. And that as the people organize, they will set up a fascist state and they will repress people. That's one thing. That's very different than saying that you advocate a violent revolution. We need to be clear on this, right? This is, this is, this is nuance. Nuance is something that people on the internet don't seem to be able to handle, but I know you all can handle because this is in real life. Is it possible that we could have a situation in the United States where our ability to peacefully organize is suppressed? where democracy is turned off, or we'll be forced to do what Abraham Lincoln did and defend our democratic rights and carry out a social revolution. Is that possible? And would that involve violence? That's possible, sure. But we don't want that, and we don't advocate that. We advocate a peaceful transition to socialism. The question is, will they allow it? And if a violent revolution happens, it doesn't come from us. We want a peaceful transition. It comes from them and their refusal to allow it. John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. Mm -hmm. And we have to be clear about this, and this is important in our particular context. And the reason that it's important in our particular context is not simply because of this nuance. It's because of the fact, and it's not simply a legal question either. I mean, you know, people, is it legal to advocate the violent overthrow of the US government? I don't know. I mean, technically no, but then the Supreme Court has ruled Brandenburg versus Ohio. We don't know, OK? It's, it's legally questionable. But even if it weren't illegal, right? Working class people right now are having chaos brought into their communities by this system. They're having instability brought into their communities by this system. The ruling elite are fighting with each other. There's all this fear of civil war. And what working people want is stability. And if we approach them saying that what we want is civil war, what we want is violence, what we want is chaos, we're looking like we're on the wrong side. We want an end to the chaos. We want an end to the violence. We want an end to the instability. We want to bring order to the United States of America. And our four-point plan that we've written out that is much like the Bolsheviks. What did they offer? Did they offer chaos and violence? No, they offered peace, land, and bread. And that is what our four-point plan is. Four economic programs, four policies that would change the nature of US society, that would empower the working class, that would weaken the power of the capitalists. That is what we advocate. And if those four points were implemented, that would be a huge push on the road to socialism and emboldening the working class. Um, and we advocate that. those programs, those four points, as a way of bringing stability. And we have to be clear about this. However, I've always pointed out that all the great communist revolutions of history, they're not made by communists going around and advocating violence. They're acts of self-defense. And nothing is more American than the right to self-defense. Henry Wallace said during the Second World War. He said, the people's revolution aims at peace, not at violence. But if the rights of the common man are attacked, it unleashes the ferocity of the she-bear who has lost a cub. 
when Nazi psychologists tell their master Hitler that we in the United States may be able to produce hundreds of thousands of planes, but that we have no will to fight, they are only fooling themselves and fooling him. The truth is that when the rights of the American people are transgressed, as they have been transgressed, the American people will fight with a relentless fury. They will drive the ancient Teutonic gods back into their caves. The god of Damarong is coming for Odin and his crew. The people are on the march toward an even fuller freedom than even the most fortunate peoples of the world have hitherto enjoyed. The people's revolution is on the march, and the devil and all his angels cannot prevail against her. Woo! Yeah. So I'm gonna end with this. You can join CPI, you can not join CPI. You can get involved in the work that this organization is doing, or you can choose not to. But this train is heading out of the station. That's right. So it's better, it's time to get on board, because we're headed no one knows where. Yeah. Thank you very much. Killian's going to close us with Charlie Chaplin's great speech from The Great Dictator, and that'll be our closing ceremony. So take it away, Killian. All right. I don't want to get much of an intro for this, but I'll just say, if you have not watched The Great Dictator, you can watch it for free on YouTube. Very funny for what it is, but this speech is something else. I'm sorry. But I don't want to be a dictator. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should want to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. And in this world, there's room enough for everyone. And the good earth's rich and can provide for everyone. And the way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. More than cleverness, we need kindness. More than machinery, we need humanity and gentleness. Without these qualities, life would be violent and all would be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness of man, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now my voice is reaching millions across the world, millions of men, women, and little children all victims of a system that makes men imprison and torture innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say this. Do not despair. The misery that is upon us now is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass, and dictators die. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, who tell you what to do, what to think, what to feel, who, treat, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate. The unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery. Fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke, it is written, the kingdom of God is within man. Not one man, nor a group of men, but in all men. In you, you the people have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You the people have the power to make this 
this life a wonderful adventure, to make this life free and beautiful, then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give you men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the, promise, by the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us use that power. Let us fight for a new world. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! I do want to make sure everyone is aware I have a fundraiser for the Uhuru movement where I'm selling uh, these Pan African necklaces and some Pan African flags. All the money raised goes directly to the Uhuru movement to help with their legal funds.